in the Philippines and all over the world, people are saying that democracy is failing, that states are failing. In this present context of our campaign here in the Philippines, the presidential campaign, we are introducing a new concept of governance. In the past, governance was just basically connected, equated with government. In our, in our case, we take the true meaning of democracy, demos kratos, power of the people, power of the citizens. So we're going to broaden the concept of governance to move beyond government per se, but also involve, most importantly, what we're calling civil society and then business itself. These are the three main powers of any society. Business represents economic power. The state or the government represents political power. And civil society is the cultural power of any society. Uh, let me illustrate it by a drawing so that we can see this uh, quite clearly and how this innovation is of significance and deep importance for the emergence of good governance and true democracy. If, uh, if example, if you take this to be the society as a whole, and then in here you have basically the context of nature, because even uh, as we speak about governance, it's always important to embed society in nature. If we forget nature, we forget the source of life of all of human existence. We cannot destroy, destroy nature in any concept of government or governance. So here we would identify three major areas of society, uh, basically the economic, the political and the cultural. The, the notion of the state is very clear and also of business and culture is not so visible and most people have a misunderstanding of culture because culture tends to be really invisible. Cultural deals with our worldviews, our assumptions, our values, our attitude, our behavior, in short, our identity. So this is very important in the governance concept because here the key actors here or the key interests in the economy are, is our business, whether small, medium, large. Okay, the key actor here of course are, is government and in culture we have what we call civil society as a cultural power. This understanding of civil society was what I tried to emphasize when I wrote the book, Shaping Globalization, Civil Society, Cultural Power, and Threefolding at the Turn of the Millennium. Uh, and this book was released in the State of the World Forum. That was a parallel civil society meeting with the UN Millennium Summit. And basically, this understanding of civil society is cultural is a new turn, in fact, in sociology itself, but even among activists. Because for a long time, civil society, because it was active, was mistaken as political. No, civil society engages society politically by advocacies from the outside. And also then, if I use another drawing here, another color, okay, it engages, but also business, for example, when civil society boycotts certain products out of business, then it's not running business itself, it's actually affecting the demand for the product. Because demand lies in culture, basically in the realm of civil society, demand in, let's say, in the market, and the political system requires legitimacy if it, if it is to function. If a government has no legitimacy, it cannot function. It's always questioned, there's no trust, people are always going to resist, and this is the reason why civil society gives the legitimation function, not just the state itself. That's why the state uses propaganda, business uses advertising to try to convince the larger culture under which it is embedded that it is doing the right thing. Now, 
in the past, um, especially taken from the American Revolution, was the introduction here in the political sphere was introduced a certain kind of balance of power. So you would have the executive branch, then the legislative branch, and then the judiciary. Okay. So the idea was that to, co to govern properly, to have true governance, you have to have a balance of power between these three. Now, in the context of the Philippines and in the context of uh, near totalitarian demo so-called democracies or states around the world, the executive often controls the legislative and the judiciary. In the Philippine context, basically the present leadership of this country, the executive leadership of this country, which we consider as illegal because there was cheating, Arroyo controls the legislative branch of government by payoffs of, of, of all congressmen, many congressmen, and then also the judiciary. She's appointed 14 out of the 15 Supreme Court justices. That's why the political life is basically under the control of an elite, a power-hungry elite, and a wealth-greedy elite, affecting the lives of millions. I mean, it's really basically for them and not for the Filipino people.